In this video, we're going to explore a linear programming solution and explore how to interpret the sensitivity report. So we've done a problem, uh, this problem before in the videos, so you can go back and reference a, um, a two decision variable problem uh, with a maximization objective function. So we're going to work through the creation of the Excel, Excel sheet uh, relatively expediently and spend the bulk of our time focusing on the sensitivity report. So um, RMC Inc. is a firm that produces chemical-based products, in particular processes, three process, in particular, in a particular process, three raw materials are used to produce two products. The material requirements per ton are as followed. Uh, for the current production period, RMC has available the following quantities of each raw material. Because of spoilage, any material not used for the current production must be discarded. So we have our constraints uh, right here. And then if the total, if the contribution to the profit is $40 for each ton of fuel additive and $30 for each ton of solvent base, how many tons of each product should be produced in order to maximize the total profit contribution? So again, we already know the answer to this if you've watched the previous videos. So we're just going to work through um, this pretty expediently so we have fuel additive and we have solvent base and we're going to label these x1 and x2 uh, respectively um, we're going we're told that the profit is forty dollars for fuel additive and thirty dollars for solvent base so we have a total profit this will be our objective function, and we're just going to write out our objective function just for good practice. Max Z is equal to 40 X1 plus 30 X2, right? And this is all explained in a previous video if you need to revisit this. Our constraints are such that for material one, material one is equal to two fifths of material one for X1 and one half for X2. We'll label this our left-hand side and our right-hand side. And we're told that this must be less than or equal to 20. Material two, well, material two, there's zero X1 and one fifth of X2. Again, less than or equal, less than or equal, whoops, less than or equal to five. And then material three, I should say material two, and then material three, in this case, we have, well, three fifths of X1, so equals three divided by five, and three tenths of X2 must be less than or equal to 21. We can format our cells for our decision variables here. Um, so we'll just give it a nice thick border, just so we remind ourselves. And then we'll write in our objective function. So we're gonna say sum product. In this case, we're gonna highlight the profit that we'd make and then our decision variable cells. And we'll go into it and we're just gonna put dollar signs in front of the columns and numbers and rows just to lock our reference cells. So your equation should look something like this. So sum product. B5C5 comma B3C3 with dollar signs in front of the B3 and C3. And then we're going to do the same thing for our left-hand side. So sum product. I'm going to highlight those uh, columns and then by our decision variables. And we're going to put our dollar signs in front of the letters and numbers. So your equation should look like this. And then we're just going to drag and drop. <clears throat> okay, so we have quickly set up our Excel spreadsheet. Let's go to solver now. So data, solver. And you should see a pop-up window that looks like this. And what we're gonna say is we're first gonna set our objective cell. So that's where our total profit is. We're looking at a maximization, so we're gonna click maximization. We're going to select our decision variables, so that is the variables that we've highlighted in yellow. And then we're gonna add our constraint. Now, nice for our model, 
we notice that our constraints are all less than or equal to the right hand side so in this case we'll just highlight them all at the same time so uh, d8 to d10 that's our constraints for material one two and three less than or equal to the right hand side so then we're going to click ok and your window should now look like this we're going to sh make sure that we check the box make unconstrained variables non-negative we're going to click simplex lp and then we're going to click solve now i recognize that i'm going a little quickly through this construction of the lp solution um, again it's covered in a, at a slower pace in probably a little bit more detail in a previous video so if you need help setting up your linear programming please go back and see a previous video it's on this exact problem so you should have no problem setting it up so make sure that simplex lp is clicked and then we're going to click solve and then you'll see a pop-up window here. Uh, so solvers found a solution. All constraints and optimality conditions are satisfied. We're going to ask it to keep the solver solutions. As we've done before, we're going to ask for an answer report, but this time we're also going to ask for a sensitivity report. So now we're going to click OK. And what we see is that we get our optimal solution here. So 25 tons of fuel additive and 20 tons of solvent base gives us a maximum profit of $1,600. We can go to our answer report and we'll see the same thing. So in our answer report here, we see that our total profit, we have a maximum of $1,600. And we see our decision variables. So our optimal solution here is 25 tons of X1 and 20 tons of X2. We notice that material one and material three are binding, meaning that there's no slack left over, and material two is not binding. In other words, there is slack left over or there are resources that are left unused. So that's our interpretation of our answer report, but let's go to our sensitivity report since this is something that we haven't explored before in these videos. So in our sensitivity report, we notice that we have this column called variable, This section called variable cells and this other section called constraints. So in this video, we're going, to section, we're going to focus on our variable cells. Now, just for the sake of reminding ourselves, our objective function was equal to the max of Z is equal to 40 X1 plus 30 X2, right? This is exactly what we agreed was our objective function on the previous slide or on the previous sheet. So we're just writing it there. Now, what do we notice here? So our variable cells, our fuel additive, and our solvent base, X1, X2, we notice the final value, 25, 20. This is our optimal solution, right? This is exactly what Solver has reported, both in our workbook, our 25, 20, as well as our answer report, 25, 20. So 25, 20 is our optimal solution. We also notice something called the objective coefficient. So in this, we notice that it's 40 and 30. Now that looks awfully similar to our 40 X1 plus 30 X2. Now that's because these objective coefficients are exactly what we put in our workbook or our worksheet, right? 40 X1, 30 X2. This is the coefficient of X1 and X2 respectively. So this is not a surprise to us. But then we see these columns that are called allowable increase and allowable decrease. And we see that the variables are a little bit different for uh, both X1 and X2. So for X1, the allowable increase is 20 and the allowable decrease is 16. Meaning <clears throat> that for X1, we can decrease the objective coefficient by up to 16 and increase the objective coefficient by up to 20 and our optimal solution will not change. In other words, we can have 40 minus 16 is 24. So 24 less than or equal to our coefficient of x1 less than or equal to 40 
plus 20, 60. Okay, so our range of our objective coefficient is such that our optimal solution of 2520 will not change as long as the coefficient in front of x1 or the amount of profit we make from fuel additive x1 will not change as long as we're making at least $24 of x1 and less than or equal to $60 of x1. For x2, we see that we have an objective coefficient of 30, an allowable increase of $20, an allowable decrease of $10. So in this case, 30 minus 10 is 20, less than or equal to the coefficient of x2, less than or equal to 30 plus 20, which is 50. So, so long as that we're selling x2 for at least $20 a ton, and less than or equal to $50 a ton, our optimal solution of 2520 will not change. Importantly, we are only making one change at a time. We're not changing both x1 and x2. We're talking about changing the coefficient of either x1 or x2. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. What do I mean? So perhaps we said, what if we want to sell x1 by an increase of $10 per ton. So max Z is equal to, instead of 40 X1, we're going to say 50 X1 plus 30 X2. Well, if we were to do that, what would happen? Well, 10 is less than or equal to our allowable increase of 20. So 10 is less than 20 which means that our optimal solution will not change. What changes though is our profit, right? So is equal to 40 plus 10 times 25 plus 30 times 20. And really I could do instead of 40, I'll just put that in there. There we go. And what we notice is that we get a profit of 1850. Now, what was our profit before? Well, we can just do this very quickly. The objective coefficient times the number of units for both X1 and X2. So what we notice is that by increasing the profit from X1, we will increase our profit by $250. Importantly, our objective, our optimal solution of 2520 has not changed, but our profit and our objective function does change. So we'll still make 25 tons of X1 and 20 tons of X2. The only difference is that instead of selling X1 for $50 a ton, we're now selling it for, sorry, instead of selling it for $40 a ton, we're now selling it for $50 a ton, which results in a profit of, two, uh, of an additional $250. Now, what if instead of selling X1 for $50 a ton, we wanted to uh, reduce our, our selling price of X1? So instead of $50 at $40 a ton, we said the max Z is equal to, let's say 35 X1 plus 30 X2. Well, five, a decrease of five, is within our allowable decrease of 16. So because of that, our optimal solution of 2520 will not change, but our objective function does change, and consequently, our profit also changes. So is equal to the initial objective coefficient minus $5 times the number of units plus our objective coefficient of x2 times the number of units. In this case, our new profit, if we were to um, sell X1 for $35 a ton instead of $40 a ton, well, we're going to make $125 less, right? 1600 minus 1475 is 125. 
we could do the same thing that we just did, but for um, but for um, x2. So perhaps we want to look at, well, what would that mean for x2? So let's say instead of selling x2 for $30 a barrel, we wanted, or a ton, we wanted to sell it for $35 per ton. So our initial was 40x1, plus now we're going to say 35x2. Okay, so we're increasing the objective coefficient by $5. Well, five is within our allowable increase of 20, right? Five is less than 20. So our optimal solution will not change, but in this case, our profit will change. So it's equal to 40 times the number of units plus the initial coefficient plus our change of five. So now 35 times the number of units. In this case, we're going to now make a profit of $1,700, right? More than our initial profit. This is our initial objective function, 40x1 plus 30x2 of $1,600. Now let's say we wanted to offer a discount on our solvent base. So instead of selling it for $30 a ton, we're now gonna sell it for uh, $25 a ton. So we're still gonna say 40 X1, but in this case, in this scenario, we're gonna say 25 X2. Okay, well five, so 25 X2, so a decrease of the objective coefficient of five is within our allowable decrease of 10, right? Five is less than 10. So it's within our allowable decrease. And because of that, we know that our optimal solution won't change. So our optimal solution remains the same, but what changes is our objective function and our profit. So in this case, we have 40 times the number of units plus 30 minus five, right? Decreasing that objective coefficient by five times the number of units. In this case, we see that we're going to have a profit of $1,500. So where before we were selling X2 for, 20, for $30 a ton, in this scenario, we're selling it for $25 a ton, and understandably, we expect to make less profit. So I think that will do it for this video on the variable cells. In a next video, we're going to talk about interpreting the constraints and shadow price, um, but that is enough for this video. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If this video helped to make business analytics easy, consider giving the video a like. And if you need additional help with business analytics, please consider subscribing to the channel. I look forward to solving many more problems with you next time.